Good morning, Drew. How are you? Hi, Leslie. How are you? I'm uh, fine. It's very nice to meet you. You too. And and very good of you, especially at this time of the morning, very good of you to uh, moderate for us. <laughs> no problem at all. Would you mind if I just tested my share screen? Yeah, go ahead. So you've made us all co-hosts? Um, I don't know. Kai, is that something you do or do I do that? Yes, I'm working on it right now, actually. Okay, yeah. Okay, fine. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you Kai. Hi, Marie. <laughs> Hi, Drew. Nice to see you. Yeah, same. How are you doing? I'm okay. Good. Ah. Do people mind if I'm having a cigarette before, <laughs> before <No>. it starts? <laughs> That's a very wow. French thing to do, to be honest. <laughs> <clears throat> Great t-shirt, by the way, Drew. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I have a To the Lighthouse one someplace. Well, uh, I we don't cite either. Of course, we do flash. I am disappointed you are not wearing a flash t-shirt. I've got to say. Not I have that I have one, but. <laughs> I've never seen a flash t-shirt. <laughs> Neither have I. <laughs> Leslie, you also talked to this guy, uh, this guy, Ali Case, who is from England. He's a grad student doing a lot of work on Flush. Oh, he's, great. Yeah, and he's very jazzed about uh, that people are working on Flush again. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, Mary Christie and I, you know, found when this is, uh, as you know, part of a, a book project. And, you know, I had read Flush you know, in the in the mists of time as a grad student. And I must admit at the time, didn't particularly get it, um, mm -hmm. you know, and um, uh, I, this was a long time ago, but I studied with Susan Dick who had a sense of humor, but had no interest in flush. So we just kind of skated right over it. So um, coming back to it all these years later, I thought, this is, this is exceptional. Yeah. It's really good. <laughs> and, it is. Uh, it is. Thanks, thanks to Ollie, I dragged out my old American hardcover. <gasps> oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm having a book lust moment, I've got to say. Yeah. It has these lo uh, lovely Vanessa N papers. Which I've only seen. I'm, yeah. We're going to be showing uh, those two drawings. Yeah. But, um, oh, what a, what a treasure. Yeah, they're pretty. Um, I don't even remember where I got this. Um, is this a first edition? It might be. Yeah, it is. So it's now, a retirement fund. <laughs> on the inside, someone wrote 35 cents. I did not oh, pay 35 cents for wow. it. Um, but someone did. Some, wow. one, one day. Um, <laughs> and of course, yeah. you know, not only do we love these books as fetish items, um, yeah. but there are always there are always material aspects of the books, you know, that yes. come into play. Um, Mrs. Yeah. Dalloway, for example. I didn't know until I read an article about it that whereas the British edition has 12 sections, you know, for the 12 hours, per, right. the American edition only has 10. Yes, yes. You know, those kinds of things or, or you know, when you talk with people who've um, never seen the photographs for Three Guineas because their edition didn't have them. Right. And also the weirdness of that there are two versions of To the Lighthouse as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. That she corrected proofs, different, I mean, different sets of proofs for different countries. I know. Oh, I mean, like... completely understandable if you're that kind of busy. Um, but of course, to us, we're thinking, oh, how could that be? But of course, it you know gives us things to talk about. Well, and, and what's the authoritative version of the text? And what do we do when there isn't one? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And here is Mary Christine joining us. All right. So we're all set. Um, Kai, could we uh, share our screens now? Yes, you should be able to. Okay, I'm going to do that then, thank you. Oh, I'm getting, um... all right. So you can see my slides, all right? No, I just went into mine and I clicked multiple participants can share. So try it again. Okay. There How's that? Yeah, that works. Great. And I'll just make sure that they're active. Great. All right. Thank you. That's working. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop sharing for now. Yeah. There we go. Let's see. Good morning. Hello. 
<laughs> I'm Marie Christine, Leslie's co-conspirator. Yes, nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Let's see, are we getting more people in? Yeah. Okay. So it looks like we have all of the panelists here. So what I figure we'll do is I will introduce I'll introduce the panel. I'll introduce each of you individually before each of your papers. And then you'll deliver your papers and we'll save all the questions until the end. <clears throat> we'll wait to officially get started here in a second. All right, hello everybody. Welcome to the first panel of the morning. Uh, this is Ethics of Reading. Uh, so welcome everybody, I'm Drew Shannon and I'll be uh, moderating the panel. And what I'm gonna do is go ahead and introduce uh, each individual speaker or sets of speakers as they deliver their papers and we will have time at the end for questions. So if you wanna start dropping questions in the chat along the way, Kai Hinson, our chat moderator, We'll keep track of those and we'll hit all of those once everything is finished. Um, and at the end too, you probably all know the protocol by now, but there is a raise hand feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, you can always use that to get um, my attention if you want to speak and you can also just wave <laughs> as long as you have your cameras on. Uh, but we will go ahead and start. And uh, our first presenters are Leslie Higgins and Marie-Christine Lepps. And Leslie Higgins is a professor of English at York University. Uh, she specializes in late Victorian and modernist studies. The author of The Cult of Ugliness, Aesthetic and Gender Politics. She has also edited three volumes of Ger Gerard Manley Hopkins' prose. Research interests include world literature, feminist studies of modernism, textual studies, and poetry. Uh, with her is Marie-Christine Lepps, an Associate Professor of English at York University, who is the founding coordinator of the Graduate Diploma in World Literature. Author of Apprehending the Criminal, the Production of Deviance, she spe specializes in literary and cultural history, world literature, and discourse analysis. Her current project focuses on fictions of friendship. In autumn 2022, Higgins and Lepps will publish Heterotopic World Fiction, Thinking Beyond Biopolitics with Wolf, Foucault, and Andachi. And their paper is called Jus d'Esprit or Ethical Experiment, The Lessons of Flush. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone can see the slides. We're great, thank you. I will be presenting, I have that pleasure, and Marie Christine will be answering the questions. Wolf's parodic biography of Elizabeth Barrett Browning's dog mounts a complex double argument, an argument against normalizing reading practices and for an ethics of reading generated instead shared responsibility for gender, racial, and class conflicts. Michel Foucault's concept of the experience book provides the grounds for our transgredient analysis. 
Against powerful truth regimes, Wolf and Foucault offer experience books, fictions that do more than demonstrate facts or establish historical truths. They engage the writer and reader in dialogical processes of becoming other. An experience book, Foucault insists, quote, is neither true nor false. An experience is always a fiction. It's something one fabricates oneself that doesn't exist before and will exist afterward. By entering into, quote, a difficult relationship with truth that in some degree destroys it, such fictions can function as agents of change. They constitute heterotopic space times that, like a mirror, displace the reader into this other space in which the reader is not, yet is. The reader sees itself not to confirm an identity, but in Wolf's words, to insubstantize all identification, to multiply, refract, and differentiate. To produce such fictions, the female artist must begin by gagging the voice of patriarchy. In Professions for Women, Wolf explains, the reader must destroy, quote, an immensely charming phantom, the angel in the house who stands between me and my paper. At last, I killed her. She died hard. Her fictitious nature was of great assistance to her. It is far harder to kill a phantom than a reality. Correspondingly, Foucault insists that intellectuals must distance themselves from a position of universality and work instead in localized struggles in a new, quote, connection between theory and practice. An experience book, he states, unlike a truth book or a demonstration book, has the function, quote, of wrenching the subject from itself, of seeing to it that the subject is no longer itself or that it is brought to its annihilation or its dissolution. This is a project of desubjectivization. Wolf concurs, avant la lettre, quote, great writers often require us to make heroic efforts in order to read them rightly. They bend us and break us. Reading such text, quote, produces at first a queer feeling that the solid ground has been twitched from under us. And there we hang, asking questions in midair. We have gained a sense of astonishing freedom. Experience books move the reader from passive consumer of stable historical truths obtained from a fixed perspective to active, mobile co-producer of contingent knowledge. Quote, to adventure into that wilderness, Wolf warns, is an ordeal, an upsetting experience, which plies the reader with questions, harries him with doubts, alternately delights and vexes him with pleasures and pains. Such texts block the reader's view of the past, exude doubt, cause exile from every assurance. This endearing coming of age story of a naive and affectionate Cocker Spaniel, a best selling book of the month club selection, is not only a satirical indictment of intersecting discourses of gender, class, race, and empire, and the subject positions they delimit, but also a lesson in the limits of liberation tactics. Quoting from authorities, including poems, letters, and Thomas Beam's The Rookeries of London, this improbable tale asks the reader to see from two different positions, the unknowing, accepting, enthralled, and the knowing, discerning, resistant. Wolf's point of entry is to intervene in the circulation of Barrett Browning's legend in order to critique its discursive conditions of emergence. The romance of Sleeping Beauty rescued by the dashing prince of poetry and swept away to a palace was being revived again in Rudolf Bézier's The Barretts of Wimpole Street, which was a theatrical success to scandal that Wolf saw on the 6th of October, 1930. And this is a still from the production that she saw. Her response was twofold. In an essay on Aurora Lee, she states, quote, Nobody reads her, nobody discusses her, nobody troubles to put her in her place. In short, the only place in the mansion of literature that is assigned her is downstairs in the servant's quarters. More dramatically, Wolf displaces the poet's legend by creating a new one, all about her willing lapdog. By focusing on the pet, Wolf's satire provides the reader with a different way of experiencing the surround of archival facts to calculate the costs of love, love for women, dogs, and fathers, for romance, 
home and empire. Three main tactics are used, we are arguing, satire, correlation, and displacement. Satire initiates a complicitous relation between reader and writer, displacing both from recognized truths. Correlation critically assembles facts to generate new knowledge. Displacement transposes common truths onto geopolitical struggles, thereby foregrounding the epistemological and ethical imperatives of shared responsibilities. Tactic one, satire. Flush stages what Barrett knows, that white middle-class women and female poets in particular enjoy the same standing as lapdogs. In a letter to Robert Browning, she stresses, I am your flush and he is mine. Wolf dramatizes the correlation rather than quote the passage. Flush is the physical, emotional, and social double of his mistress. Both share wide mouths, deep brown eyes, and heavy curls, quote, broken asunder, yet made in the same mold, each perhaps completed what was dormant in the other. Their complementarity fulfills Victorian understandings of womanhood. Imprisoned in the so-called bedroom school with Barrett as teacher, the male dog learns, quote, to resign, to control, to suppress. That is, to be meek, docile, dutiful, happy to lay quietly and lovingly at his mistress's feet, while the invalid Elizabeth lays on the sofa, obeys her father's wishes, and writes, the lapdog of patriarchal relations of force. Flush is chained when walked. She, quote, could not go out. She was chained to the sofa. Love weakens both. Anthropomorphizing the dog allows the text to flush commonplace truths supporting great men and subjugating women down the satirical drain, desiccating romance. For all who adore the Barrett Browning legend, Wolf's tale is a warning. Flush's mind, imagined as that of an upper class gentleman, serves as prism for the commonplace truths that exercise power through a series of essentialist assumptions. The dog's biographer uses earnest, and hence farcical, tales of etymology, conquest, and breeding to gush over his subject's eminence. Canine determination of pedigree, established by the Spaniel Club, is judged superior to that of the Herald's College by the narrator, who grudgingly admits, however, quote, that the latter at least makes some attempt to preserve the purity of the human family. The correlation defamiliarizes the deadly desideratum of racialized purity as extends from Barrett Browning's day to Wolf's, from eugenics to Nazis, and to the present. Animal husbandry, both business and source of pleasure, is thus positioned as yet another story of conquest and legitimation, articulated to race and gender, trophy pets, trophy wives, and trophy daughters. The biographer's assurance is continually satirized from the first words that state, a la Austin, it is universally admitted that. Reveling in the wealth of information on canine heritage, the narrator laments the absence of same for servants. The reader, however, is made to notice what does not count. Always present, servants remain imperceptible, their material conditions unnoticed. Even the biographer's extended endnote on the faithful servant, Lily Wilson, and quote, the great army of her kind, the inscrutable, the all but silent, the all but invisible servant maids of history, can only dwell parenthetically, quote, for a second on the extreme precariousness of a servant's life. Thus, the text demonstrates how ignorance is produced as vehicle of power relations, thereby duplicating the effects of the Browning legend. Correlating gender and class multiplies and compounds the impact of systematically generated ignorance. Tactic two, correlation. Spatial correlations highlight class divisions in racialized terms. The narrator reveals that quote, not a stone's throw from Wimpole Street behind Miss Barrett's bedroom, for instance, is St. Giles, quote, one of the worst slums in London. Quoting the Rookeries of London, which describes St. Giles, quote, as a penal settlement, a pauper metropolis in itself, 
The narrator then moves on to Whitechapel, the East End slum where, quote, poverty and vice and misery had bred and seethed and propagated their kind for centuries without interference. The narrator recycles beams to create Flush's understanding of Whitechapel when held for ransom. He sees, quote, hordes of half-naked men and women, these horrible monsters, some were ragged, others were flaring with paint and feathers, squatted on the floor, the demons pawed and clawed. Even more unsettling for Flush is the sight of, quote, the dogs of the highest breeding, chained dogs, footmen's dogs like himself, behaving like their subhuman captors, quote, they tore and worried a festering bone that they had got between them. Flush and his biographer are disturbed by the lack of essential differentiation. Breeding, high or low, should always tell, regardless of material circumstances. Such correlations, however, highlight the functions of using racialized discourse to apprehend the working classes, to serve as alibi for ruthless exploitation, and conceal how Wimple Street rests comfortably on Whitechapel misery. Discourses of race, class, and gender are forcibly correlated in the physical and dramatic center of the biography. When flesh is dognapped, power relations are exposed and reversed, and both the dog and his mistress are transformed. The balance of power is suddenly destabilized. To her astonishment, the men surrounding Barrett choose to fight, quote, in the interest of their class by refusing to negotiate with the thieves. Up until the June 1845 bill for the further prevention of the offense of dog stealing, ransoming dogs was a booming business rather than a crime. One could be sentenced to seven years transportation for stealing a dog's collar, it was noted during parliamentary debate, but one could steal a dog with impunity. The recalcitrance to recognize dogs as property stemmed from their association with feminine emotional attachment rather than utility. Legislation was enacted only after Parliament received a petition and a report from the Select Committee on Dog Stealing. When Flush is stolen in 1846, Barrett's father and brothers, and even her then secret fiance, all reject the ransom demand. Paying it, Robert Browning argues, would be, quote, a lamentable weakness, positioning anyone who did so on the side, quote, of the execrable policy of the world's husbands, fathers, brothers, and domineers in general. Left without allies, Barrett conscripts her terrified maid and goes to Whitechapel. From her carriage window, she sees what she has been trained to ignore, a mysterious world, quote, where women lived like herself while she lay on her sofa, reading, writing. They lived thus. They were to inspire the most vivid passages in Aurora Lee. Wolf's text refuses to sentimentalize the scene of recognition. Elizabeth forces her horrified maid into submission. She never leaves her carriage. She hurries back home to her privilege and still must demand her brother's help to get Flush back. Yet the text also insists that, quote, Miss Barrett was not to be intimidated. Rejecting the role assigned to her, she will not submit to the will and reasoning of the men who love her, even at the risk of losing her beloved good opinion. Both poet and servant know that Flush's value is not to be monetized, not to be circumscribed in terms of class or gender. They know the bonds of love and duty that tie them to this living creature and will not let men fight proxy class wars over its body. Tactic three, displacement. Structured as a series of spatial displacements, the novel tells a tale of progressive enlightenment, from the innocent minority of puppydom at Three Mile Cross to adolescent pretensions of racial superiority on Wimple Street, forcefully destroyed by Whitechapel, to majority, with freedom, democracy, happiness, and world citizenship in Florence. Each stage in that Bildung's Roman is marked by a concomitant detachment from previous identities. In Italy, where the Spaniel Club does not reign, Flush softens towards mongrels. Quote, he was the friend of all the world now. All dogs were his brothers. 
The final aha moment comes when Flush loses all marks of pedigree when shaved by Browning to relieve him from the torment of fleas, a suffering correlated, quote, to Savonarola's martyrdom here in Florence. At first feeling emasculated, diminished, ashamed, Flush then reconsiders, quote, what am I now? He was nobody. Certainly he was no longer a Cocker Spaniel. But he soon realizes that to be nothing, that is not, after all, the most satisfactory state in the world. Reading this triumphant enlightenment life story in all its sweetness and formidable prose, no doubt accounts for the novel's success, a bestseller in both the UK and the US. Barrett Browning is equally transformed, quote, for fear was unknown in Florence. There were no dog stealers here, and she may have sighed, there were no fathers. But soon enough, Barrett Browning can be seen staring into nothingness, as she did in London, but now also subjugating herself to, quote, evil smelling, seedy looking men and their seances. Flush outlines the limits of liberation narratives by making the dog the philosopher and the poet the victim of hoaxes in a city they both misread as the land of milk and honey. Thus, only the reader learns to know differently. Because the dog and its biographer cannot or will not read Barrett Browning's work, like those who love the brilliant, the doomed, the adored poet, but ignore her poetry, they overlook her engagement in world political struggles. They cannot know that Kazagwiti Windows, after embracing populism, laments the return of marching troops. They cannot know about her anti-slavery work and a curse for the nation, nor her poems before Congress. Having demonstrated that the legendary only makes sense within relations of domination and subjugation, Wolf's satire asks the reader to refocus on material struggles, to reconsider Il Duce's Italy, to refuse quiescence. Her writing, quote, takes us and reads us, flouts our preconceptions, questions principles which we had got into the habit of taking for granted, and in fact splits into two parts as we read, making us, even as we enjoy, yield our ground or stick to our guns. In short, Flush teaches us a new ethics of reading. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, and will Marie Christine be be talking in the Q and A afterwards, Leslie? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so we'll move on to Luca Pinelli. Uh, Luca uh, studied at the U uh, University of Oxford and the University of Bologna, and is currently a second year PhD student in transcultural studies in the humanities at the University of Bergamo, Italy, uh, in conjunction with the University Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris. His research project investigates the intersections between the two mothers of second wave feminism, Virginia Woolf and Simone de Beauvoir. His research interests include Oscar Wilde and the fin de siècle, uh, English modernism, European feminisms, queer theory, phenomenology, and radical writing. And his paper is entitled Towards an Ethics of Sexual Textual Ambiguity, Virginia Woolf, Simone de Beauvoir, and the Ethics of Reading. So, Luca. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you, Drew, for the introduction. Can you all see my presentation? Yes, okay, perfect, yes. thank you. Let me see if I can start the slideshow, yeah. Okay, so in the final version of How Should One Read the Book, published in the second comma reader in 1932, Virginia Woolf famously wrote, that independence of thought is the most important quality that a reader can possess. While in society it may be important to be bound by laws and conventions, in the act of reading we have none, and we should never respect the authority of other people, however heavily furred and gowned they may be. If we could banish all such preconceptions when we read, Wolf goes on to argue, that would be an admirable beginning. Her advice is then framed in the following terms, and this is the third quote on my slide. Do not dictate to your author, try to become him. 
be his fellow worker and accomplice. If you hang back and reserve and criticize at first, you are pre preventing yourself from getting the fullest possible value from what you read. But if you open your mind as widely as possible, then signs and hints of almost imperceptible fineness and the twist and turn of the first sentences will bring you into the presence of a human being unlike any other. Nearly 30 years later, in 1964, Simone de Beauvoir gave a lecture on the role of literature. Her talk, published a year later, is premised on the idea that literature is, and I quote Beauvoir, if it is authentic, a means of overcoming separation by affirming it. As Beauvoir goes on to argue, and I quote again, literature only begins at the moment when I hear a singular voice. In fact, we attach much more importance to language than we sometimes say. There is no literature if there is not a voice. That is to say, language that bears the mark of someone. It takes a style, a tone, a technique, an art, an invention. It can be something quite different depending on the writer. The author must impose their presence on me, and when they impose on me their presence, at the same time, they impose their world on me." End of quote. In both accounts of the reading process, the author seems to be a spectral presence in the text, with a letter being, uh, sorry, bearing some distinguishing marks of its producer. The reader's task in Wolf and Beauvoir's view is to immerse themselves in the language of a text, to become the author, to enter their singular world through their language. In particular, in the first part of the process, Wolf suggests suspending judgment on what is being read in order to let oneself be absorbed in the narrative without necessarily producing an argument about it. Beauvoir's insistence on the notion of voice equally draws attention to how perceptive readers have to be in order to approach another person's world as represented and mediated by a text. In both accounts, the first task of a reader is to let, let the text resonate with them so they can create a communication channel with a different world. In her second philosophical essay, The Ethics of Ambiguity, published in 1947, Beauvoir highlights the tragic ambiguity of the human condition, and I quote Beauvoir, the subject is still a part of this world of which he is a consciousness. He asserts himself as a pure internality against which no external power can take hold, and he also experiences himself as a thing crushed by the dark weight of other things. This privilege, which he alone possesses, of being a sovereign and unique subject amidst a universe of objects, is what he shares with all his fellow men. In turn, an object for others, he is nothing more than an individual in the collectivity on which he depends." End of quote. The human condition is profoundly ambiguous, Beauvoir argues, because human subjects are torn between the position of sovereign subject operating as a consciousness in the world and that of the object of other people's actions. Faced with this position or situation, as Beauvoir calls it, the human subject is meant to overcome it by pursuing ends that construct a future that is different from the past and the present. This drive to renew existence, to construct a different situation, is termed transcendence. Its opposite is imminence, the state of perpetuation of the given in Beauvoir's terminology. I would argue that if we adapt Beauvoir's dichotomy to the act of reading, immersing ourselves in the text as we read is what we could call textual imminence, whereas transcendence would imply bringing something more to the text so that it speaks to our times and all needs. If it is important that women uh, think back through their mothers, as Wolf argues in a room one's own, I think it's necessary for us all, regardless of our sex or gender, to think back through our mothers of thought, to use an expression used by some feminists in the 1970s. In this context, my paper intends to be a tribute to Toria Moy because she has paved the way for my research by functioning as a watershed in the reception of Wolf and in that of Beauvoir. In Sexual Textual Politics, published in 1985, Moy famously tried to restore the feminist quality of Wolf's work by highlighting, highlighting sorry, how misunderstood she was, even among feminist critics. In the second half of sexual, sexual Textual Politics, she opened her section on French feminism by focusing on Beauvoir's Marxist 
feminism, I remarked how this model was mostly taken over by Lacanian psychoanalysis and what, be and what would be naturalized as French feminism in the following years, that is the Holy Trinity of Sexu, Irigare, and Christeva. And I've included a reference to a wonderful um, paper by Christine Delphi, uh, who is a French materialist feminist um, at the time, um, which you know it, it explores this, this relationship between Anglo-American criticism and French feminism. Almost a decade later, Moy published one of the landmark texts on Beauvoir, Simone de Beauvoir, the, the Making of an Intellectual Woman in 1994, which was incidentally republished in a second revised edition in 2008, as previously unpublished material came to light. The first half of my title, uh, sorry, the first half of the title of my paper is clearly an echo of Moy's 1985 text to sexual textual politics. This is because I would like to open Beauvoir's notion of existential ambiguity to the interplay between sex and text in a way that should resonate with anyone who's familiar with Moy's work. The Norwegian critic stressed the importance of the textual strategies implemented by women in the works so that Wolf's theory of androgyny, for instance, should not be interpreted by Patricia Walter and other scholars as a flight from femininity. Um, instead, Moy convincingly shows how it is necessary to work on, and I quote her, a feminist criticism that would do both justice and homage to its great mother and sister without rejecting her as an insufficiently feminist or praising her on grounds that seem to exclude her fiction. End of quote. In her view, these were the two main problems, the reception of Wolf at the time. So she was either discounted because she was not feminist enough, enough or she was praised but just for the essays not for the novels and um, short fiction in bovarian terms the ambiguity of wolf's theorization in her essays especially in her room one zone was only treated at the time in its transcendence that is to say many feminist critics were looking for a mother of thought who could point them in the right direction and they were hoping to find this direction in wolf this, this also happened, for instance, in Italy, as Elisa Borghi's wonderful work on the Italian reception of Wolf shows. In her latest article published in The Italianist, Borghi points to the history of a Milanese feminist collective who, based on Italian feminist philosopher Luisa Muraro's work, started looking for a potential feminine and feminist genealogy by looking at fiction written by women in the preceding decades. The act of reading in that group was, as Borghi emphasizes, a political one, and therefore the group used literary texts to stimulate personal and political observations that could orient the political praxis towards more theory-inflected articulations, end of quote. While the group insisted on the void and the silence into which women living under patriarchal ideology were relegated, and in line with Eric Garay's thought, they were hoping to explore that subaltern position rather than filling the void. They found in Wolf a woman writer who attempted to do precisely what they felt was not really necessary, at least for them, that is, filling the void. The result was that these feminists were drawn to Gertrude Stein rather than Wolf, because as Bolke explains, um, and I quote, Although they found Wolf's metaphor of the room useful, they also found that Wolf conceptualized the desire to fill the void with a literary language that was still observant of male symbolic order. End of quote. This reading with a purpose, however useful from a political and even personal point of view, seems to be at odds with the ethics of reading as elaborated by Wolf, Beauvoir, and Moy. What goes over the reader's head in cases like this is precisely the te sexual textual ambiguity of Wolf's fiction or essays. By reducing ambiguity to a set of arguments or to linear narratives, these readers cannot appreciate Wolf's sometimes oblique critique of patriarchal ideology because they were looking for a style that was more in line with Eric Garay's notion of écriture féminine. A recent article by Valérie Favre Arun Wanzone's resistance to feminist interpretations and feminism published in 2020 not only summarizes the debates on the kind of feminism proposed by Wolf, often understood according to the essentialism versus constructivism binary, but also proposes a convincing reading of the text. As Favre encapsulates it, 
and I quote, Wolf develops a textual strategy which both resists feminist direction and precludes any definitive, um, any definitive uh, feminist interpretations or appropriations of the essay, which he also openly, if partly ironically, disavows feminism and sketches out an elusive feminism of her own, end of quote. As a room clearly shows an allegiance somewhat paradoxically to both of the main strands of feminist theory, that is essentialism and constructivism, any criticism of this text should acknowledge this openly without necessarily suggesting that one or the other theory is preferred by Wolf or her narrative persona. Reading ethically means accounting for the sexual textual ambiguity of a work like A Room without necessarily instrumentalizing it for practical ends. If we're only interested in finding in a text something specific and practical, we cannot suspend judgment and allow ourselves and let ourselves be carried away by the narrative. Like the Milanese and the Anglo-American feminists of the 1970s, we might be tempted to find a direction in the text, which nevertheless always eludes us, at least in the case of Wolf. In How Should One Read a Book, and again, I'm referring to the final version as published in the second Common Reader series, Wolf is far from giving, sorry, that, that was a bit of a spoiler there. Um, Wolf is, uh, is far from giving actual advice to her readers, despite her, uh, despite her wonderful formulations about becoming the author and suspending judgment. Wolf pursues a line of thought that is far from linear. If I were to represent her argument in this final version of the essay, the line would probably zigzag through the text without ever reaching much of the conclusion. Wolf, or the narrator, says that in the first part of the reasoning process, we should suspend our judgment and immerse ourselves in, in the flux of fleeting impressions that are part of the narrative. Then she suggests, she suggests that reading is a bit like writing, so we should try and write something ourselves. In order to do so, we should turn to the classics like Defoe, Jane Austen, or Thomas Hardy. And yet, no, we should never discount other books because they're not art, whatever that means. And so the narrator goes on to point to all sorts of questions that literary theory is not quite answered yet, like how far, and I'm quoting Wolf, how far is his book influenced by its writer's life? Or how far shall we resist or give way to the sympathies and antipathies that the man himself rouses in us? When we're almost ready to write, we should turn to poetry instead, possibly comparing different poems and poets. And yet this word compare how difficult a task it conceals in its recesses. So Wolf goes on to argue that a second part of the reading process is necessary. And I quote Wolf again, we must pass judgment upon these multitudinous impressions. We must make of these fleeting shapes, one that is hard and lasting. End of quote. The second part, however, is much more of a challenge than the first one. And I quote Wolf again, to continue reading without the book before you, to have read widely enough and with enough understanding to, say, to make such comparisons alive and illuminating, that is difficult. It is still more difficult to press further and, and to say, not only is this book, sorry, not only is the book of this sort, but it is of this value. Here it fails, here it succeeds. This is bad, that is good. To carry out this part of a reader's duty needs such imagination, insight and learning that it is hard to conceive any one mind sufficiently endowed. Impossible for the most self-confident to find more than the seeds of such powers in himself." End of quote. Would it be easier to leave this task to the gowned critic she initially asked us to ignore then? Perhaps it would be easier, but we should not abandon our quest as readers, because reading passionately is an unparalleled virtue not even St. Peter at the gate of paradise will be able to promise anything better than that. This not quite so concise and yet non-exhaustive summary of her arguments already shows that zigzagging movement of her voice in the text. If we immerse ourselves in its textual imminence, if we become wolf as she interrogates herself on how to read a book, we are disarmed and helpless and possibly amused by her tone and sagacity. If we bring to the text some of the literary theory the rest of humanity has been coming up with, we are transcending what the essay is saying in order to let it answer different questions in different ways. What remains important, as Beauvoir em emphasizes in The Ethics of Ambiguity, is acknowledging that even, and I quote, the most optimistic ethics has, um, have all begun 
by emphasizing the element of failure involved in the condition of man. Without failure, no ethics. Well, our task as, reader, as readers is to activate the ambiguity of the text without slipping into the extremes of textual imminence or textual transcendence. It is fundamental to remember that it takes time to do so. And during our attempts at grappling with the textuality that sometimes evades us, we should always be alert to the textual practices we are privileging and why. Without this self-criticism, without time, without constant questioning of our methods and our aims, there is no ethical reading. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Luca. All right. So we will now move on to our final speaker, uh, who is Marie Allegre, and she is a fourth year PhD candidate and French tutor at the University of Birmingham in the UK. Her doctoral thesis explores the psychoanalytic, especially Lacanian and post-Lacanian receptions of Virginia Woolf produced in the English and French traditions between the late 1980s and the early 2020s. She is on the organizing committee of the Graduate Center for Europe at her home institution and part of the French Feminist Research Network. Please pronounce that for me, Marie. I'll get it wrong. It's called Les Jesus. Les Jesus. Okay, yeah. I, would, I would have been yeah. close. Uh, so thank you, Marie. Uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, Drew. Can you all see my screen all right? Yes. Yeah, okay, brilliant. So thank you very much, Drew, for the introduction and to obviously all of the organizers for this uh, conference. It's just really, it's a, it's a genuine pleasure. So my paper today, uh, yeah, by the way, I've put a link to the paper in the chat if you want to follow along in, in on, on the Google document. So my paper, my paper today is entitled Working with, with Virginia Woolf's Ethics, um, Reparative Psychoanalytic Literary Criticism. So from the complexification of relations between fact and fiction through Orlando's queered androgyny to her staging of ambivalence and her stylistic uses of tensions, Woolf's crossed womanship bears witness to uh, what uh, we can call if it works, there we go, um, to what we can call uh, the irreducible heterogeneity of lived experience and embodiment. And I'm happy to obviously unpack everything I've just mentioned uh, in the, in the Q&A. And it is precisely in this accommodation of many foldedness and contradiction, this aesthetic resistance to elucidation, that I locate Wolf's ethics. This means that here, I take ethics to mean being attuned to complexity and to the individual and collective responsibility that this makes room for and requires. In turn, I would define an ethics of reading and interpreting Wolf as relying on a similar refusal of university, a preservation of the multifarious and sometimes contradictory paths she sends us on, perhaps also as an awareness of her theoretical investments of her reading. So psychoanalysis has been interested in Wolf's treatment of, I quote from Wolf, that queer conglomeration of incongruous things, the modern mind, from about the 1930s. From uh, the 1970s onwards, uh, Wolf's uh, critics um, and the feminist scholars amongst them, uh, notably, reinvested various psychoanalytic uh, frameworks such as Freud's object relation theory and from the 1980s Lacanian and post-Lacanian interpretation. And it is the latter set of intersection uh, that my thesis investigates. To what extent have Wolf's Lacanian and post-Lacanian receptions been hospitable to her propositions? So referring to paradigmatic examples, this paper argues that more often than not, uh, Wolf's uh, binary or non-dualistic uh, ethics have either been obfuscated or commodified by Oedipal perspectives. And in turn, what does an ethical conversation between Wolf's work and psychoanalysis look like? Drawing on metacritical approaches, my thesis makes the case for reparative reading one that starts from and addresses, also incorporates what edible theory has participated in othering. In 1971, psychoanalyst uh, Andre Green argues that the only unconscious material to which the psychoanalytic critic can have access to and tap is their own. 
the interpretation of the text therefore becomes, I quote, the interpretation that the critic must give himself of the effect of the text on his own unconscious, end quote. And Green recommends that this subjective epistemology, as he calls it, quote, this exercise in self-analysis be preceded by an analysis performed by another, or if one prefers, by an analysis of the other, end quote. My thesis proposition continues Green's, but with the difference that I understand this analysis of the other to refer specifically um, to the psychoanalytic uh, discourse uh, on on Wolf uh, itself. And this is all the more relevant uh, since, as Green insists, the psychoanalytic critic, just like all critics obviously, comes to the text with all the theoretical knowledge he is steeped in. More recently, Rita Felsky states that, I quote, scholars identify like mad. They're no less invested than others in the works they respond to. Indeed, they're often more invested, even if the reasons for their investments and the idioms in which they express them differ, so differ from, from uh, the non-academic uh, reader, as it were. Self-described uh, text worker and uh, French critic uh, uh, Emilie Noteris uh, recently reinvested uh, Cedric's notion of reparative reading with reference to the ancestral Japanese art of Kintsugi. So the idea is like when mending a broken plate or cup, one does not glue pieces back together trying to hide the cracks, but one magnifies the reparation with gold leaves. And the result of such process is an object that both reflects the wreckage and creates something new from it. In turn, I take uh, reparative criticism to refer to a process that highlights the restrictive matrix, uh, matrix at the heart of Oedipal interpretations, and that puts them in conversation with non-binary epistemologies to include what they have served to obscure, but without denying the history of this foreclosure. So what I have endeavored to do within the scope of my thesis, in Derrida's words, is to begin with the other, starting from what a system tried to exclude. So Oedipal and especially Lacanian and post-Lacanian readings of Wolf tend to refer to interactions with, uh, amongst other things, the non-human in strictly anthropocentric and binary gendered terms. And this has a twofold consequence. First, literary Lacanianism uh, renders binary what in Wolf is more of a dialectic persistently exceeded in the matter of what uh, Merleau-Ponty has called a hyperdialectic. I quote, uh, a dialectic without synthesis, which is not a sign of futility, but of a good dialectic. And the, corolla the corollary to this reduction is that the phenomenological, non-anthropocentric insights of Wolf's texts are at best unrecorded and at worst simplified and pathologized. French psychoanalyst and modernist scholar Josiane Pacouguet reads uh, To the Lighthouse in her own words, I quote, as a jarring review, harboring a semiotic code and a ciphered truth of buried affects at its core. And these three approaches were the structural uh, framework based on an aesthetic of lack. I quote, Lacan's novelty with respect to traditional philosophical discourse is that it defines object relations in terms of lack. And this is Bakuigi's uh, uh, quote. As a result, Mrs. Ramsey's moment of being watching the lighthouse at night reads, Pakoge writes, as I quote, a point of contact with the real, which abolishes the distinction between subject and object. And indeed, the ambivalent scene does seem to lend itself to such a reading. So what we have among other things is, is the last stroke of the lighthouse uh, feeling like, quote, her own eyes meeting her own eyes. Um, and then she has a sense of becoming one with the lighthouse as with a lover. Then we've got the ominous notion of being, quote, at the beck and call of the light, um, the polysemy of the stroke as well, which is both uh, a caress and, and, and a blow, and obviously uh, the close to orgasmic end of the passage. Um, I quote, the ecstasy burst in her eyes and waves of pure delight raced over the floor of her mind and she felt it is enough, it is enough. So all of that would be uh, would tend to be coherent with Bakuge's idea of a dangerous excess of enjoyment. 
And what this is, in, in Pakoige's perspective, is an attempt to return to the unmourned for mother. I quote, the gaze is turned inwards towards a, a vanishing point, the spot of time often related to a maternal object endowed with too much enjoyment and gone too soon, which was obviously Wolf's case. And we can talk about that last bit and the Q&A if, if people are interested in that. In other words, the subject becomes one with the object in the attempt to join the mother in non-being. And this is also, by the way, how Pakuge describes uh, Mrs. Ramsey's uh, quote unquote, feminine mode of enjoyment of the sonnet later on in the novel. I quote, she tastes the sounds and the color of object words among which her body forgets its own existence until it becomes the thing itself. So Mrs. Ramsey's ecstatic contemplations have become a hypnotic flirt with psychic death, something which is emphasized by evoking Rhoda from the waves about whom Pakoge writes. She was never ushered into the dialectics of lack and desire. So not only does this equate any experience in uncharted territory with psychic regression and solipsism, but the association of Mrs. Ramsey with Rhoda also smoothes out distinctions between the two stories and characters. Mrs. Ramsey does not dissolve in melancholy, I think. If anything, hers are moments of complex, ambivalent emotion and pleasure, which Oedipal structures rather simplify. And as a counter example, we can think about uh, Elsa Hochberg's uh, uh, reading of, the, of that uh, passage of To the Lighthouse yesterday. What matters in the example I just, I just gave is more the application of the Lacanian structure uh, than Wolf's craft and reader's experiences. And this is obvious in the fact that Paco gave often uh, uh, uses the, the phrase, this structure, this Lacanian structure is enacted in. And within this whale old, this whale oiled, pardon me, psychoanalytic mechanism, there does not seem to be a non-binary, non-dualistic alternative to either the symbolic or an engulfing real. And this is rather similar to Patrick McGee's reading of, of The Waves as a novel that I quote, destroys the separation between subject and object. And Maggie also misses the life affirmative aspect, aspects of Wolf's images and, and novel in all their uncanniness and ambivalence, because he reads Wolf's quote, fin in the, waste, in the waste of waters as I quote, cadaverized, reduced to a dead shell of meaning. On the contrary, I think that it is this form of Lacanianism that reduces Wolf's explorations to conceptual skeletons. As Wolf has it herself, I quote, when philosophy is not consumed in a novel, when we can underline this phrase with a pencil and cut out that exhortation with a pair of scissors and paste it into a whole system, it is safe to say that there is something wrong with the philosophy or with the novel or with both. As phenomenological accounts of Wolf highlights, her work, I think, does not destroy the boundaries between subject and object, throwing characters and readers alike into uh, psychic chaos. Rather, her texts seem to imply that a neat binary division between subject and object is nothing but a dangerous, although reassuring, fantasy. So we could say that her novels give us uh, Wolf's personal uh, version of quantum ontology, uh, so based on the existence of phenomena rather than of independently existing things. If Anne Benfield's uh, celebrated but uh, rather dualist reading of Wolf does not really go beyond binary frame frameworks, she does make the following key point. I quote, Wolf's characteristic conception of death is the separation of subject and object. Death is one name for their in independence. End of quote. So when life is recorded from the perspective of a flower bed in Kew Gardens, or when a voice describes the Ramsey's empty house in time passes, even though no one is there to look or listen, I don't think that Wolf is anticipating the Lacanian real. Rather, her use of anthropomorphism in her description of the non-human is precisely what goes against anthropocentric ontology. By placing subjectivity in the non-human, Wolf gives it back its agency, therefore making room for the unobserved, so what Anne, Benf uh, Anne Benfield has called uh, unoccupied perspectives. And this is, I think, Wolf's a radical means to represent the world, not as governed by binary principles, but as what new materialisms speak of as entangled phenomena. 
In a recent edited collection of psychoanalytic responses to new materialisms, Catherine Van Vert reads, I quote, Virginia Woolf avec Lacan contra Deleuze. And she argues that Deleuzean and new materialist emphases on multiplicity and becoming act like, quote, a totalizing force that cancels subjective destitution in a false promise of plenitude. In other words, new materialist perspectives negate the split at the heart of human subjectivity, the one enacted by language, so symbolic castration. However, new materialist and non-binary readings of Wolf do not posit quote, a desire that lacks nothing. Rather, the aim is to conceptualize an outside of the binary lack-based set of alternatives opposing subjective dis dissolution to castration. So what Wolf describes, uh, in other words, only escapes the symbolic if the symbolic in question is a binary one. So, and this will be my, my concluding, uh, uh, concluding sentences, turning symptomatic reading against a certain form of Lacanianism, my thesis aims at giving a more generative account of Wolf's works. So not one which would be the only viable one, but one which is nevertheless present. And this necessary if one is to be able, as Rita Felsky puts it, quote, to teach students ways of analyzing texts that open up new experiences of, new experiences of these texts. Or again, as Wolf uh, writes, quote, to find that state of mind in which it seems possible to us to write the book, not to read it. In June 1940, Wolf dreams of inventing, I quote, a new critical method something swifter and lighter and more colloquial and yet intense, more to the point and less composed, more fluid and following the flight, end quote. And I believe it is, it is possible, as Wolf writes, to keep, quote, the flight of the mind yet be exact, to create hospitable critical spaces that would no longer be described as a denial of symbolic castration. Thank you very much to everyone for the time. Thank you, Marie and Luca and Leslie uh, for those terrific papers. Um, so uh, we can go about this a couple of ways. I think there, I don't know if there are questions in the chat or we can just begin by opening up to questions. People can raise their hands, jump in, however you would like to proceed. Do we have questions? Maggie. Sorry. <laughs> um, absolutely fabulous papers. I uh, was really moved by them, actually. Um, I just want to try and tie together Lucas and Marie's, possibly, in that um, reading my collection of Italian feminist thought which I can't remember when I bought it, it may have been 1975 even. <laughs> um, one of the ethical, key ethical concepts in it is this notion of pairs of women acting as mother, mothers to other women, as mentors, as supporters. Um, not your, importantly, not your mother, but doing that. Um, and the Milanese bookshop, um, as it was known, um, uh, promulgated this idea and it does seem to tie in with Marie's theory uh, ideas of post-Lacanianism because one key post-Lacanian critic thinker is uh, Ettinger, Brocker Ettinger, whose theory of the matrixial gaze I've always found very compelling and I wondered if you might like to say how that fits in with your ideas. Yes, thanks, thanks, Maggie, for, for that. Actually, I read one of your one of your articles about uh, Bracha Ettinger, and I, I really liked it. And I started to read one of her one of her books, and then um, I thought, oh God, um, I'll, I'll have to go back to chapter writing. So I haven't actually <laughs> used it in my thesis, but it was definitely one of my biggest regrets because um, one of the kind of the, the limits of my work is that I kind of open up psychoanalysis with non-binary uh, epistemologies, but I would like to turn to 
you know, current non-binary psychoanalytic theory in order to like, you know, not just be like, just, you know, this, this is, this is not working to just use something. And I think that I, I kind of was surprised and like, I don't think that Ettinger is, is, uh, has ever worked on Wolf, has she? No, but um, she's got an exhibition currently, and this is rather interesting uh, for me, in uh, which Nicolas Bourriard has put on in Paris. I think it's in Paris. Um, and it, they both agree that his theory of relational aesthetics seems to work with, with um, Broca, with, with Edgar. Yeah. And I was just struck because I hadn't, I was so pleased to hear that reference to the Italian feminists that I had found so exciting in the 70s, um, you know, to hear that again. And I thought that maybe it was a link between you, both of your work, which obviously it never occurred to me till I heard your papers today. But uh, yeah, I find Griselda, Griselda Pollock on. I think uh, much easier to understand. Yeah, yeah, because I, I read, yeah, I read her pre the preface to to the book, and I was like, oh yeah, that's the that's clear as day. Very yeah. helpful. Yes, yeah, so I need to dive in a bit more. I need to go back to it. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions and comments. Uh, yes, Gwen. This is a question for, for Luca. Uh, wonderful paper, wonderful paper. And it's not directly related, but I'm just wondering, since I feel that you obviously work a lot with Wolf and, and Beauvoir, if you've been applying this in your, in your further work to some of their novels or their fiction, and I'm just curious where you might see that playing out in, in their other work that's not, you know, not nonfiction or essayistic. Thank you for that question, um, Gwen. Good to see you uh, here online. Uh, we've been <laughs> um, writing emails. Um, yeah, so, well, I, I have to say this is not really part of my thesis. So my thesis is going in a slightly different direction. So I'm, I'm, my idea for this paper was just to, um, you know, pay homage to Tori Moy's work and think about the ethics of reading um, from Wolf to Beauvoir and back. Um, and obviously that, um, as I try to show, that applies especially to the essays because, you, you know, we generally have a, the idea that essays have to give us some kind of um, straightforward message that we can take home and, and then apply to our life or to other other, other sorts of writing, but whenever you read a, a, an essay by a wolf, you'll find much more than that. And it, you, you probably don't find the nugget of pure truth that she refers to in the room of one's own. Um, and so that, that, that's uh, where, the, where I got the idea for this paper. But my, my thesis does look at uh, three novels by wolf through um, mainly Beauvoir's philosophy. So I'm looking at Orlando, The Waves and um, between the acts. And um, yeah, I have to say that the, the concept is slightly different. So there's no ethics in it. It's more about the body and intercorporeality. So I try to adapt some of the notions that we, we can borrow from phenomenology to the analysis of uh, three of Wolf's novels. So yeah, it's, it's kind of a different thing, but yeah. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your answer. And that, that's perfectly fair. I'd, I'd love to read that as well, but another time. Uh, let's see, Professor Hagen. Thank you, Professor Chamberlain. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> um, I, uh, this, this is a great panel. Thank you so much. Um, so, so thought provoking. I'll be thinking about this the rest of the day, probably. Um, uh, and actually the previous question, Gwen's, Gwen's question actually, I think anticipated something that I had in mind that was also, that also looped back around to, um, uh, uh, to Leslie and Marie Christine's attention to flushes, flush as satire. Uh, and, so, and so this distinction between essays and fiction, the reference to satire, um, I'm, 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 this is a question for the whole panel. I'm kind of curious how distinctions between genre sort of in general factor into some of these theories of reading, right? If for instance, each paper in some ways is, is deriving an ethics of reading from Wolf that we might bring methodologically to Wolf, 
how does in some sense that how does that especially given wolf's own interest in genre which she shows us and how she'd want to read a book how, how does how does sort of moving moving among among genre fit into this into your sort of ideas or reflections on on ethics, right? Is it part of that? How does it play in, say, to ambiguity or into that irreducible heterogeneity or, or into um, some of these other um, concepts or distinctions? So I hope that makes sense. But that, I was just kind of curious how genre, in maybe in general or specific genres, factor into this. Marie Christine, I see you unmuted. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, if I if I may, I think it goes. Your question goes to the heart of the matter, and Leslie and I just uh, completed a book where we argue that Wolf, Foucault, and Ondaatje are actually producing, crafting a new genre, which is heterotopic world fiction, and that through this genre, they can. Um, launch a series of experiments and experiences for the reader so that the chronotope that this genre produced is, is transhistorical and transnational because they, all of them go back to, you know, Herodotus and ancient Greeks and Gilgamesh. And they also project to this possible future so that the, the, the genre is the thing. I think you're absolutely right. And by crafting a kind of subgenre of world literature, they are um, allowing, producing, enabling a different experience, a heterotopic experience for the reader. Because the the genre, heterotopic world fiction, is not just about space, but about heterotopic processes of knowing. I could go on, but there are other speakers who have been yeah. asked the same question. Thank you for that. Very interesting. And I think, by the way, your book is in the, the promotional flyer that Amy has yes, sent around. Yes, so do... uh, shipping in September. Right. So, so just, just want to shout out. How fresh is that? Thank you. Hot off the press. Well, and thank you for the plug. Um, <laughs> if I may add, the as many people know, the excitement of being a promo code is unlike um, anything else in our academic lives. Um, could I just add, though, that uh, Ben, your very good question also reminds us about one of the challenges of reading Wolf, and um, and this is something that I would say um, is something that is entrenched in a lot of the Wolf scholarship. Uh, prior to the 1980s, and, and that is, not only is she not allowed to have a sense of humor, um, but there is no understanding of, shall we say, the tactical use of irony and of satire. Um, and that's one of the things we're most interested in in our work. And I would have to say, I think the first critic I ever read who suggested that there was, um, we needed to think about satire in relation to Jacob's Room. Otherwise, it's just a sad book. I mean, at the end, holding up the shoes, you know, why are we not in tears? Because I would suggest the novel wants us to be in tears and at the same time going slap, slap. It's Alex Wordling in Virginia Woolf in the Real World who, you know, suggests not to appreciate the irony in satire is to miss the point, which, and then I'll stop because other people want to contribute. For us, um, we're arguing that to uh, not to appreciate irony and satire and how tactically they are deployed, deployed by Wolf is to not understand not only the ethics of reading that she is always working out and, and trying to um, engage the reader in, but also to understand the, the profound politics of her work. And, and we've seen in these conferences and the wonderful volumes that come out of the conferences, how these uh, shifts in thinking about Wolf and working with Wolf have changed. And um, I would say to your very good question that, that irony and satire are, are really our way in. That's what, she, that's what these books give us. Even when they seem to be the most sympathetic or the most tender or the saddest, um, not to appreciate these other points of view that are flourishing is to miss the point.
Uh, Derek. Thank you. Um, great panel. Uh, I'm tempted to ask all sorts of theoretical questions after the, the last two papers, which are very thought provoking, lots of ideas um, coming from those. But actually, what I would like to do is keep Leslie and uh, Mary Christine speaking for a little bit longer, if that's OK. Um, because, yeah, I love this um, run through of the, the various strategies that Wolf uses in Flush. But I also loved your PowerPoint. And what it did for me is it really made clear uh, and, and made me think a lot about how the illustrations become part of those strategies. Um, and there was, but so, so we've got the illustrations that Wolf included, but actually there was one illustration that you included that I hadn't seen before. And I wondered if you could put it up again um, so that we could have another look. It's the, I think if, if I followed it correctly, it's a portrait of Flush by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Is that right? Um, I wondered if you could tell us something more about that and whether there are other portraits by Elizabeth Barrett Browning of Flush. Um, anything you can tell me about that would be, I'd be really interested to hear. Okay, so you're asking me to turn things back on. Um, so if Absolutely, you'll, yes. if you'll just give me <laughs> a second, I have the PowerPoint. Hang on, can I share my screen? Uh, uh, yeah, Drew, is that all right? Yeah, yeah, you should be able to. Okay, you you notice I. All right, so okay. everyone can see the slides. So let me just go through them quickly. Um, yes, this was something that we found, you know, the pleasures of just trolling the internet till you find things. Um, sorry, it has to do its little thing. This is uh, what you're asking about is something that we found in the archive in the New York Public Library. And this is Barrett Browning's original pencil sketch of Flush. Um, and the writing that you see um, uh, uh, perpendicular just simply says, Elizabeth B. Barrett, 1843, London. So this was, um, you know, what, if you Google, you know, Google Images will get you there eventually. Um, you know, it's part of the, <laughs> the serendipity of the search, right? We've, we, Christine and I um, started looking for images in the winter. You know, you work for an hour a day, you have fun, you find things. And then this just popped up. Um, and unexpectedly, and of course, as we all know, one of the, the challenges of having uh, collections dispersed is you can find things anywhere. So this was um, searching the New York Public Library records and other Barrett Browning related archives. Like there could be something buried in Texas that I have no knowledge of, um, but I, we were delighted to find this. Well, can, can I just thank you um, on behalf of myself and also Jane Goldman, who I believe is hiding away somewhere in this room. I know it's not like her to hide away, but <laughs> she, she is here somewhere. Um, yeah. Because I, I think, Jane, we're going to have to find a way to include this image in, well, in our Cambridge There's edition. also another one in one of the letters where she, she says it's a portrait of Flush, it's another little cute drawing, and it's actually a self-portrait. <laughs> Which, of course, um, we tried to demonstrate. Um, just before, sorry to interrupt, um, in case it helps, what you probably can't see is the um, acquisition number that's stamped on it. If you're writing, yes. it is 65 B as in Bob, 2390. Mm. Um, but we, we tried to, um, if I can just go back, the, Yes, the, the, the extent to which they look alike, um, which we tried to show. And now, of course, this is not flush uh, that you see on the left. Um, this is stock, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, but, you know, <laughs> uh, we wondered at first, um, you know, why choose this particular portrait of Bear Browning? But it's because she looks so much like any Cocker Spaniel. Um, um, so, yeah, I, I, again, part of the playfulness of the text, not what would you say, Mary Christine, not to disparage Barrett Browning, but to mock 
the reader's desire. I mean, how many people um, say, you know, people look like their pets. Um, and I, I think that um, in, in the many descriptions of Flush, um, Wolf is again trying to, shall we say, derail uh, the typical way in which we read and the way that we want things to make sense, the way that we want to um, overload text with our emotions, our sentimentality, rather than taking, you know, an astringent um, snap out of a kind of approach to these things. Yeah, Leslie, that's wonderful. And that's that's really what she's doing by messing with these portraits. I mean, there is actually a photograph of Flush that um, Trekkie Parsons uses in the, I think it's the 1983 republication of Flush. So she slaps um, an actual photograph of, of Flush as a, a, a puppy on, on the front of Wolf's novel. And, and I think that's so diminishing because the whole point is Wolf avoids giving photographic evidence of the lived flush because, you know, in my view, Pinker is the star. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it's, it's kind of elevating and making you really understand as a reader that you have to pay attention to illustration. Um, and, and that, you know, you can't just flick past it in a biography and think that it's there to kind of somehow affirm a lived reality. Um, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll be quiet, but, but thank you so much. Have you put your paper up so we can all read it? Well, we have not, um, but that's not because we're hiding it. It's because we are actually in the middle of reading the proofs for our book. Um, and so our paper doesn't have any of the notes or that in it. And, and we were a little embarrassed by that. So that's why we haven't shared it. Um, um, if I could just make one more point about the illustrations that you mentioned, I think that that also obtains to uh, the Vanessa Bell illustrations that are provided because they yes, surely yeah they are part of that you know that fantasy of the the Sleeping Beauty rescued by the prince and whisked off to the palace in Italy. Um, they're charming. Um, yes, and because if I can interrupt you, Leslie, uh, this is how we do, Leslie and I, when we <laughs> write. Uh, the because the the photos are sweet they are part and charming they are part of the tales satiric warning against love so-called love and the patriarchal forces that made uh, the loving mistress transform her dog into a lap dog and herself into a lap dog and how this this legend that everybody loves and keeps talking about is only makes sense if it is placed at the intersection of discourses of patriarchy, class, gender, race, etc. Because we didn't have time, but race and empire is everywhere in Flush as well. So the, the only way you can love Barry Brown is if you don't read her and you love empire and race and gender and all of those things. And who can't love a puppy? <laughs> uh, Laura. Yeah, this was my hand up, not because I can't love a puppy, but because I wanted to uh, <laughs> kind of m move the conversation further. I, I, I basically have a very simple question, but trying to bring the papers into conversation. Um, so I was wondering how uh, Leslie and Marie Christine's notion of satire and Luca Pinelli's um, notion of uh, zigzagging arguments, well, zigzagging arguments, and Marie's um, idea about her non dualistic uh, view of experience. Uh, how they relate to Wolf's feminism and particularly to that page, those few pages in Three Guineas where she says, okay, feminism, you don't like the word, let's just tear up the word and make something new, right? And it's, I think it's exactly at the intersection of zigzagging arguments, uh, refusal of binaries and satire uh, that she addresses the notion of feminist there. And I was, I don't know, I was just wondering what thoughts you have on that.
That is a great question. I'm going to let the two others answer, though. Hello, uh, by the way, I, I saw you in Leuven, Laura. Yes, I recognize you from, from uh, the conference I organized. It's really nice to see you again. And I'm really excited about reading your book it's in a good dialogue with, uh, with the project that I'm starting next fall. So we'll be in Great. Time. So if I, if I may answer the question, I think uh, we are, I mean, we, we've come to the same kind of concept in some way with using different names or the same kind of strategy that we find in Wolf's works. Um, so I think that actually the, the, the paper that I mentioned by Valérie Favre is a very good um, summary of her uh, of Wolf's feminism and uh, this kind of te textual strategy that she uses. Although the, the, the paper is only on uh, Room One Zone, so maybe for three guineas there's uh, something else going on. Uh, I haven't got to that point of my thesis yet, so I'm not really sure I can uh, address that part of Wolf's feminism, so three guineas uh, onwards. Uh, but in a Room One Zone, it's quite clear that she's um, or the narrator is, uh, you know, embodying different strands of feminist theory as I tried to say and then and the textual strategy that you see there is very it is very much trying to make you lose your bearings in the text so it, it's kind of hard to say you know this is what 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 this is the kind of theory we should derive from the text and uh, this is actually what she doesn't agree with um so I think it's um yeah, I think the, the, the answer to the question is just, uh, well, it's basically uh, Favre, uh, Valérie's um, <laughs> paper, right, isn't it, uh, Marie? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm just basically summarizing her position, but I think it, it's such a good, it's such good work, and I really recommend reading it if you, if you haven't done so yet. But I also add that um, this very discerning comment that our papers are um, using the same are discerning strategies that are embedded within Wolf's text. Uh, we call them by different names. Um, but I think it could be argued that this is very much at the heart of Wolf's feminism. And it's partly one would suggest um, what, she, what she struggles with until Jacob's room. And that is um, how to have these uh, texts that are doing um, the zigzag, if you will, or what Melba Cuddy Keane calls turn and turn about. And that is simply insisting on there being not one method or not one style. And so whether it's a text like The Lighthouse that has two modes of writing or the waves that insistently juxtaposes uh, the interludes, um, uh, I think that I would like to suggest whether the whether the text is satirical or not, it is always this uh, paratactic um, strategic uh, kind of writing that Wolf uses to put the, uh, to throw the reader off guard, to insist that the reader not be lulled into comfort. You know, the comfort, you know, that kind of cozy comfort of reading Dickens, for example, which is not to disparage Dickens because as Wolf's essay on David Copperfield demonstrates, there's a lot more going on. But that way that you just like to, you know, cozy up to a book, settle into it and just let the book take you wherever. And Wolf's stringent tactics are, are demanding much more from the reader than that. Um, and in fact, I, I would suggest that that's why she um, develops these wonderful narrators, stupid as a bag of hammers, some of them. I'm thinking of the biography in Orlando, the biographer in Orlando, but is always saying, really, you wanna read like this? You want this person? And may I say, with all due respect, this guy, you know, showing you what to think, um, the texts work against that complacency um, very effectively and in very different registers. Uh, Marie, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to return to uh, Laura's question. Um, it's such a great question. I mean, what I find absolutely fascinating, uh, frustrating sometimes, but so productive is like that Wolf is at once uh, as I said, like constantly accommodating contradictions and opposing forces, but also she's really radical. Um, and in Three Guineas, she is, I think that her kind of let's burn the word feminism, blah, blah, blah. I think it's because in a way, 
just like what's happened, what had happened with the League of Nations and stuff, it just wasn't radical enough for her. It wasn't radical enough and it wasn't all encompassing enough because there is also this critique of imperialism, capitalism, blah, blah, blah. And I think that she wasn't seeing this happening in, in I mean, yet in the feminism of her time. I mean, I may be wrong because I'm not a historian, so I'm not uh, a specialist of that. Um, but I think she she was looking for something more radical and more encompassing. And that's the reason why. But I thought also saying she's she's I mean, as much as she says that anger, you know, shouldn't have any place in, in, in creation and stuff, I think she's she likes to be angry. She likes to burn things down. Um, and I like her for that. Um, yeah, that, <laughs> that would be my response, Laura. I'm not sure it adds anything to the conversation. That's, that's such a brilliant answer. Yeah, I like that. That she wanted things to be more radical and more interconnected. Yeah, that's the thing, because it's all about, because I think it's it's I think it's why she accommodates like radicalism and nuance, right? It's because she sees the big picture and she's a she's a terribly efficient political thinker. Um, so yeah, I think that's what it is. Can I just take this opportunity to ask Luca uh, about something? Uh, Luca, I was really interested about like I I I took the liberty of like taking a snapshot of that slide and and others as well. Um, in the in the 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 one of the works you cited, it there was this uh, quote. Um, so about how uh, Wolf conceptualizes the desire to fill the void with a literary language that was still observant of male symbolic order. I, d I don't really know what my question is, that's the problem, but I'm just so interested in this thing like where sometimes people seem to place Wolf very much on the male side of the spectrum of the symbolic order, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes it's very much the opposite. So like she either, she either has to be very maternal or very paternal. And I had that, that in one of my chapters were basically about um, between the acts. Like I had many psychoanalytic critics saying, this is the failure of the paternal metaphor. And critics saying completely the opposite, like this is this is, you know, the return of the mother and of the chaotic mother. And I was like, okay, you know, what, what, I mean, you need to decide, guys. This starts, it's not working. How about both, maybe? So I don't know, could you? Could you talk a bit more about like that quote that you that you included and and like what's behind it? What's the thinking behind it? If that makes sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely it makes it absolutely sense. Um, so this is a quote from Elisa, who's also here, I think, um, and it's based on the memos that these uh, feminists uh, wrote during these meetings where they discussed some of Wolf's novels that they were reading, and. Um, well, they basically thought that she wasn't looking for a kind of non-patriarchal or anti-patriarchal anti language in the way that some other feminist writers were doing, like Gertrude Stein, for instance. But I think also in, in, in France, for instance, Monique Critique, um, she, I don't think she'd, she'd been translated into Italian, so that's why she um, she's not mentioned, she was not read. But, um, you know, the, 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 the kind of use of language that Gertrude Stein makes in some of her writings is quite far from, from uh, the language of Wolf, I think. So th there's not, there's no interruptions or, um, I don't know, like attempts to break down the language in, in a very, um, yeah, it was also a problem of translation, obviously, as Elisa says. Um, I don't know if you want to jump in um, and say something more about that. Um, obviously, the, the translation that they read of uh, Wolf's, uh, Wolf's works were very much um, flawed and Okay, <laughs> and they, um, well, for instance, with uh, To the Lighthouse, we have a very different uh, representation of Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Ramsey, for instance. So you, you basically see her as just a housewife organizing these, um, these uh, dinner parties that don't really um, serve any kind of purpose. Whereas in, in Wolf's text, it's a bit more nuanced than that. So, um, well, yeah, yeah, Elisa can 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 address that question better than me, probably, because she wrote the paper. She actually looked at the memos. So if you Elisa, if you want to add anything. 
Yeah, I'm sorry I have to <laughs> enter the conversation, but yeah, Luca was right. I mean, of course, uh, Gertrude Stein was much more experimental and she had this sense of suspended sen sentences. What they like was the idea of not needing to fill the sentence, to complete the sentence. These uncompleteness of sentences was something they were looking for because they said, well, maybe that, that might be a, a way to say, you know what, I'm not uh, beginning and end. I'm not closed uh, in a shape. Uh, I may be something which I cannot define even myself. And they were really trying to get out of the idea of a woman can be either the artist with no son, uh, with no children, or the mother and the wife, uh, you know, the perfect mother and wife. But as uh, Luca was saying, yes, it was also mainly a, uh, a problem of translation. They read to the lighthouse in the translation where, for instance, many times uh, Mrs. Ramsey is called the wife, la moglie, instead of uh, Mrs. Ramsey, or Mr. Ramsey is called il capo famiglia, so the master of the house instead of the father. So. Uh, in the Italian version, it, a, a very patriarchal language or patriarchal references are used. And so, of course, when they were reading the novel, they found the typical patriarchal references they were trying to fight. So they didn't like it. And in fact, they said uh, Wolf is a much better essayist than a novelist. She's, she uh, is much more successful as an essayist than as a novelist. Because they read novels in translation, when a feminist retranslated to the lighthouse, their ideas changed completely and to the lighthouse became emblematic of a feminist turn in uh, female writing. So you see, <laughs> translation has mm -hmm. effect. <laughs> well, it looks like we are just about out of time. Um... But I want to thank everybody again for a terrific panel. Can we have a round of applause for our terrific panelists? So uh, thank you all again. And uh, we will all be seeing each other in other panels very shortly. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much for these, these papers. They were so great. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.